The guest acquired this aesthetically pleasing sculpture at a yard sale in 2001. Being a sculptor himself, he knew the conceptual uniqueness and craftsmanship of this piece. The sculpture was made by artist A. Ai Weiwei, a prominent figure in contemporary art known for his activism and innovative approach. The sculpture was from Weiwei's first show in New York City in 1988, titled Old Shoes, Safe Sex, reflecting on the AIDS crisis. There were about five of these that were made, and some of them were actually sold. The title One Man's Shoe resonates with Weiwei's personal history, as leather shoes were rare in China. Despite its significance, the guest had purchased sculpture for $30. However, the appraiser estimated its value in a gallery setting to be around $100,000. The guest seemed delightfully surprised to hear the value. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. A toy was brought to the show. It belonged to the guest's grandfather, who received it as a gift from his father. The item was identified as the Clown on Globe Mechanical Bank made by J&E Stevens Company in Cromwell, Connecticut, during the 1880s or 1890s. It was considered an expensive item in its era, constructed with cast iron. The appraiser explained the winding mechanism. So after we've wound it, we release the clown, so he's just sitting there like that. Then we hit down this lever, and he flies up in the air. A rarity among banks of its kind. The item was considered scarce due to a loss of stress points, especially on the clown's arms, which were prone to breakage. The particular bank was in good condition with original paint. The appraiser estimated its value to be around. I think at auction this bank would bring between three and four thousand dollars. Oh my god. <laughs> the Navajo saddle blanket, belonging to the guest great grandfather, has been stored in its cedar chest for many years. This particular blanket stands out as a fancy saddle blanket, which were often considered utilitarian. However, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, these blankets became more decorative, known as Sunday saddle blankets for eye dazzlers, as they were reserved for special occasions. The blanket, dating back to 1910 to 1920, is finely woven and shows signs of wear consistent with being used under a saddle. Despite this wear, it's a valuable and rare piece, with an estimated market value of $1,500 to $1,800 at auction. Wonderful. The guest brought a robe that belonged to her grandmother. The item was identified as a Chinese robe. The appraiser examined the robe closely, noting its unique features. It was designed for a child, likely a eunuch serving in the palace. The style indicated that it was from the 17th to 20th centuries. Certain things change, and one of the things that change is this area in the robe in the bottom. It's called Li Shui. Later on into the 20th century, this gets longer and longer and longer. The robe contained motifs representing the firmament and gold-threaded dragons. There were also round figures like flames, celestial pearls, and bats symbolizing prosperity. Made of silk with silk embroidery, it reflected the period around 1850, when numerous attendants served the emperor's need, including cleanup work. The appraiser estimated its auction value at around... At auction, I would expect this robe to sell for around $2,000. Wow, great. The guest presented a parka worn by him during climbs and races. The appraiser noted the World War II pilot's name tag on the jacket. It also bore the initials EH, signifying it was once owned by Sir Edmund Hillary, the first person to summit Mount Everest in 1953. The guest friend, Bill Denz, obtained the parka from Hillary in 1983 and later gave it to the guest as a gift. Denz, a legend in New Zealand mountaineering, tragically passed away in a climbing accident in Nepal in 1983. The guest recounted wearing the parka on various expeditions. I wore it to uh, Greenland in 86 when we went to look for the World War II P-38 airplanes on the Greenland ice cap. It was so historical, I always just wear it to special occasions. The item was made of European material with coyote fur. Due to its association with legendary climbers, the value estimated was around... I believe that at auction, this parka would sell between $4,000 and $5,000. It's just such an incredible historic piece, amazing historic find. Thank you very much for bringing it. The guest explains that the doll belonged to his mother since her teenage years, stored in his grandparents' attic. The doll was kept in a chest and taken out occasionally. 
Behold, it's the Jackie Robinson doll, a pristine composition figure snugly nestled within its original box. Jackie Robinson, renowned as the first African-American player in Major League Baseball, was famous for his pivotal role in civil rights activism. Crafted in 1950 by the esteemed Allied Grand Toy Company, wearing the Dodgers uniform and hat. In addition, a baseball bat and two brochures are also present. During that era of scarcity for black portrait dolls, the doll's pristine original hang tag stands out as a remarkable rarity. Inclusion of Jackie Robinson's signature on the program significantly elevates its intrinsic value. The doll's auction value ranges from $1,000 to $1,500, with the program alone valued at $1,500. That's great. So your total value is around $3,000. That's awesome. The guest purchased this buffet at a flea market in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, around 1969 or 1970, to use as a change table for their firstborn baby. They have fond memories of their daughter sitting in a bathtub on top of this buffet at six months old. The appraiser identifies the piece as being made by Stickley, specifically through their craftsman line. This piece was made by Craftsman, which was a Stickley company which was started at the, around 1900. This piece was retailed through their New York showrooms and likely made between 1905 and 1910. Stickley, based in upstate New York, was instrumental in establishing the arts and crafts movement. The buffet is made of oak, featuring quarter-sawn oak panels and hammered coppered hardware. And this absolutely fabulous hammered copper hardware, these wonderful big hinges, you've got the, uh, the big ring handle. It has a compartment for storing plates and bears the Stickley mark, which includes a joiner's compass and... It says, Ils ich kann which loosely translated means to the best of my ability. The piece's finish is mostly original, showcasing a color variation along the front edge due to dusting habits over the years. Despite being purchased for $25, the appraiser estimates its current auction value at between three dollars to $5,000. Okay, well that's exciting, that's fun. Now we, now we know. With intricate patterns, vibrant colors, and skilled artistry, French porcelain vases exude timeless elegance and sophistication, enhancing any space with their refined presence. They have been in their family since 1972, when their mother acquired them at an estate sale in Westchester County, New York. The buff-colored ceramic suggested its potential Japanese origin, the Satsuma. Satsuma, a Japanese porcelain, showcases lavish gilding and vibrant enamel colors on a buff-colored base. And certainly, you have all this different influence. You actually have the influence of cloisonne as well. Piece displays superb quality, featuring intricate vignettes and a striking foo dog or foo lion on top. Let's take a look at the details at the bottom. Except for the character marks, they appear as gibberish, with no meaning. The intriguing aspect is that they originate from France. These pieces likely stem from the 1870s or 1880s, around the time of the 1878 French Exposition. Despite their beauty and visual appeal, they would fetch a price range of five to $7,000 as a pair. Very nice. Calling all the jewelry lovers with an eye for Italian design. Get ready for the fabulous item of the day, a Bucalati silver pendant and chain. Once cherished by a departed friend, this piece now stands as a poignant gift in the guest's possession. The necklace is too hefty for daily wear, yet its allure endures. It's sterling silver by Bucalati, an Italian company. And they were known for fabulous gold pieces, lots of colored stones, intricate workmanship. This is a Saturn mask pendant from the 1940s to 1950s. An auction value is between... Eight hundred and one thousand dollars. Oh, that's a lot. That's, that's a lot. This artifact, originating from the owner's grandparents, dates back to the mid 1930s. Possibly the owner's grandmother's cigarette case, now repurposed for their cigar utensils. This is made of bronze and possibly white jade, offering a unique aesthetic. It's a Chinese white jade garment hook, likely from the 18th century paired with a box likely from the early 20th century. The primary value of the item lies in its white jade, prized by Chinese clients for its historical significance. Yet some may discard the rest, keeping only the valuable jade. 
Some worry that cigar smoke might change its worth, but others like its old look. Dirt in the corners makes it seem more real and attractive, not less valuable. An auction or fair market value would be two to three thousand dollars. What? Well, that'd be a that'd buy a lot of cigars, there wouldn't we it? Go. This Colt single action 45 caliber revolver with a five and a half inch barrel is a treasured family heirloom. It originally belonged to the guest great grandfather, who was a sheriff and the. I noticed this photograph here. It says that he was the first police chief in 1885. About 1885. Don't know the exact date. Okay. The revolver is factory engraved and comes with its original holster. These factory letters confirm its authenticity and notes that it was shipped to Hartley and Graham in New York in 1885. The revolver originally had hard rubber grips, but custom pearl grips with the great-grandfather's initials and a steer head were added later by Hartley and Graham. Despite some damage to the grips, the revolver's historical significance and documentation make it highly valuable. The appraiser estimates its worth at $25,000, highlighting its rarity as an engraved single-action revolver. You're kidding. No, serious. That's hard to believe. <laughs> That's a great That's thing. That's awesome. Very few engraved single-actions. $25,000? Yeah. Wow. This Stife bear, inherited from the guest mother's grandmother, is a rare find, with its beautiful cinnamon collar, great fur, pads, and shoe button eyes. It stands out as a unique piece. This particular bear is one of the first cinnamon bears seen on the program, adding to its rarity and value. It's estimated to be from around 1905. The bear is in incredible condition. Similar bears have been sold for six to seven thousand dollars making this one potentially worth eight to $10,000. So I think it was worth your waiting around. I hope you don't miss your plane. Oh, me? <laughs> this Gustav Stickley clock was brought to the show by this guest, who had to navigate a family dispute before she could inherit it from her father. Gustav Stickley was an American furniture manufacturer, design leader, publisher, and a leading voice in the American arts and crafts movement. What's spectacular about this clock is how it was constructed with quarter-sawn oak that brought about the fiery grain patterns on the case. Also, there are finely done bold tenons on the side and a faint stickly signature that speaks of the exquisite cabinetry that went into the manufacturing. The clock features a metal dial that is engraved and filled with glass wax. At the bottom of the clock was an engraved Seth Thomas movement, indicating that Stickley contracted out the clock movement manufacturing to Seth Thomas Company. The clock has been rubbed off of its banana lacquer finish, which slightly affects the value. However, the appraised value of the clock is around $3,500 to $4,000. Goodness, <laughs> you're kidding. No. Wow. This collection of photos belonging to the guest family includes a particularly rare and poignant image taken two weeks before the invasion of Normandy Beach. The guest highlights the significance of seeing the beach before the invasion, a perspective often overlooked in history. The photo was taken with the 325th Recon Unit and shows the beach at low tide. At the end of each one of those poles is a mine, so at high tide you wouldn't see them. Oh, wow. This detail adds depth to the historical context of the photo. The appraiser values the photo group at three to $500. Really? I'm so excited that you wow. brought them in. Wow, that's great. And the appraiser was appreciating the historical significance and rarity of the images. Get ready to discover how a $10 investment transformed into a priceless masterpiece in this painting. He was born in Chicago and was something of an artistic prodigy. The guest recounts acquiring the painting at a garage sale in Sarasota, Florida in 1987. The skillfulness of this artwork attracts viewers. The masterful brush of Gordon Stevenson brings this piece to life, showcasing his brilliance as an illustrator. Stevenson began his career with mural paintings in Chicago schools before refining his skills in Europe under the guidance of Spanish Impressionist Sorolla. During World War I, Stevenson painted camouflage for the Navy, and later he became an illustrator, producing covers for Time magazine. The painting is oil on masonite, likely from 1939 or 1940. We see how he's incorporated all of these sporting images into creating the image of this character. 
Sporting imagery intricately captures scenes of salmon fishing and duck hunting. And then beneath that is a chap that's fanning the fire, which is going through his lips. Uh, the dimple in his chin is uh, a frying pan. The painting exhibits minor pigment losses. The guest is currently undertaking cleaning and conservation work on the painting. It's time to unveil the current worth of this masterpiece. Today, I think this would easily sell at auction in the, between $3,000 and $5,000 range. Wow. wow. Right. Wow. This smoke-aware mug, acquired by the guest when cleaning out their parents' basement, turned out to be a valuable find. Mokaware was made in England in the early to mid-19th century, and... It was virtually never marked. It was certainly sold in England, but it was also shipped to the United States as well, where it was bought by people of modest means. They made lots of pictures. The mug features a unique decoration on the middle band, which the appraiser notes has never been seen before. This distinctive decoration adds to its value, estimated to be in the range of $1,200 to $1,800 at auction. The guest had initially stored the mug in their attic until they saw a picture of Mochaware in a magazine, realizing the similarity and prompting them to have it appraised. This medal was inherited from her grandfather that he won in the Boston Marathon in 1921. This is a picture of him to the side in his running uh, suit. And what was his name? Otto Loxo. We really are proud of him. He, he died very young, so we, I never got to meet him. He died very young. He tragically had a massive heart attack while training. The 1921 Boston Marathon was the 25th running of the iconic race. The medal was designed by artist Weenman and featured a winged woman and a laurel wreath. It was made of bronze and gold with a white ribbon. The front of the medal read Boston Marathon and the year, while the back featured the name of the winner. The medal, with its bold design and historical significance, remains the most remarkable victory. The estimate on the medal for insurance value was at $1,500 to $2,000. Really? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's exciting. Yeah. Thank you. This 19th century miniature bracket clock is a prized possession, received by the guest father-in-law from his boss, Jasper Crane. The clock, likely given in the late 1960s, is a miniature version of a standard bracket clock, making it highly desirable to collectors. The most popular today with collectors and the most valuable are the very large ones and the very small ones, like this. It features an ebonized case, a miniature handle, all feet, and a brass dial signed Grimaldi & Johnson. We open up the dial door, we can see that it's signed on the dial Grimaldi & Johnson. Indicating its origin on the Strand in London. The clock's movement, though small, is of high quality, similar to those found in larger bracket clocks. With an estimated value of six to $8,000. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'd rather have it than the grandfather clock. <laughs> I'm sure you would. It is a valuable and cherished piece with a fascinating history. The guest inherited the books from her parents, which is one of the most famous books in American literature. It was Harper Lee's first edition of To Kill a Mockingbird. There's a personal inscription by the author herself. That we have here in our country. And when we open it up, this is the first edition. It's inscribed. And who did Harper Lee inscribe it to? This makes it a special and valuable edition. The inscription connects the reader with the author's own words. It's important to understand its rarity and significance. Harper Lee's signature adds to its value. It's more than just a book. It's a piece of literary history. It's a treasure to be cherished and passed down through generations. The estimated value at auction was $15,000 to $20,000. This clock, an award from Burnett Extracts, has been part of the guest family for years, although its origins are unclear. Found in the basement, it was never prominently displayed and has not worked for as long as the guest can remember. He considered taking it to a clock shop to restore its functionality. The appraiser identifies the clock as a Baird advertising clock, manufactured by Edward Baird, who began with the Seth Thomas Clock Company in 1879. But he moved up to Montreal in 1887 and started this Baird manufacturing company. These clocks were among the first used for commercial advertising, made of papier-mâché and promoting various products. This clock, in particular, advertises Burnett's extracts, highlighting... 
Joseph Burnett was responsible for making this country's first vanilla extract. The clock features an original label inside, a rare survivor, providing setup directions. These clocks are considered collectible, straddling the world of clocks, folk art, and advertising. The appraiser estimates its retail value at $2,500 to $3,000. This. this complete collection of Mark Twain's works was brought to the show by a guest who implied that his grandfather acquired it before passing it down to him, among other miscellaneous books and papers. Mark Twain, an American writer, humorist, and essayist, is often regarded as the father of American literature. The set consists of 25 different stories considered to be Mark Twain's complete works at that time. However, the distinguishing feature of this collection is the inclusion of Mark Twain's signature, along with attached short stories complementing the main body of work. Additionally, the binding is a masterpiece that exudes classical American binding. The appraiser valued the set at around thirty-five to $50,000 at the auction. That's quite something. Thank you. Thank you. Jean doll came to the guest family from her husband's grandmother, who was a renowned doll collector. It's a fascinating doll, produced around 1875 by Brew, which was renowned as the foremost doll-making company in the late 19th century. The doll features exceptional quality with a closed mouth, a swivel head, blue eyes, pierced ears, and bears the trademark Brew Company mark at the back of the head. Although the dress and some parts of the body have been reconstructed using German leather, the doll remains a fine piece that every collector would love to have. The guest explained how the doll had been initially appraised and was skeptical about the current price due to the plummeting prices of dolls in the auction market. However, the appraiser valued the doll at between twelve and sixteen thousand dollars. Wow! Wow, that's great. The guest from St. Columbus Cathedral brought in a captivating oil sketch by Irish artist Walter Osborne. He was an Irishman, born in Dublin, and painted in a very modern way. The painting, created in 1901, depicted Eleanor Alexander, daughter of the famous hymn writer Mrs. Cecil Francis Alexander and Bishop Alexander. Looking into the family history, it was discovered that Bishop Alexander became Archbishop of Armagh after his wife's passing in 1895. Eleanor Alexander left the painting to her companion who then passed it down the family lineage before it eventually came to the cathedral. While oil sketches are generally considered less valuable than fully finished paintings, this piece is still incredible. Osborne's masterful use of brush strokes to capture the essence of the subject's dress with minimal detail is captivating. Considering the growing popularity of Osborne's work, the painting could potentially fetch a price exceeding more than 80,000. It's a possibility. That's wonderful news. The guest brought in a fascinating pocket watch, a hunter case housing a full calendar complication. It comes with some really nice features, like the moon phase display, day of the week, month, and date. An intriguing characteristic was the retrograde flyback date, where the date indicator jumped back to the beginning of the month instead of rotating in a circle. While typically a full calendar watch would require multiple levers to adjust each function, this watch only had two. This peculiarity hinted at the possibility of a perpetual calendar, a far more sophisticated mechanism that automatically adjusts for the varying lengths of months. Unfortunately, the lack of a watchmaker's bench prevented a definitive confirmation of the perpetual calendar function. Further examination revealed the watch's Swiss origin based at the frosted silvered finish and a specific technical detail related to the winding crown. The only remaining clue was a set of tiny hallmarks that, with some effort, were identified as English date marks from 1880. Considering the watch's potential as a perpetual calendar and its overall rarity, its estimated value is somewhere between... Certainly two, possibly three thousand. The guest brought in a beautiful Regency period writing table, estimated to be from the 1820s. It's a well-made piece by a likely Scottish craftsman crafted from high-quality mahogany. The guest, however, had concerns about the table's value due to sun damage from sitting in a bay window. John didn't like the curtains being drawn. 
So he, uh, so is it, is he it, it, stood in the sun. It's a working table. And it was the morning sun. However, the leather top was a later addition, likely replacing an originally designed exposed mahogany surface. This modification significantly reduced the table's value. Despite this, the table's design elements are magnificent, including the intricately carved base with Greek Revival features. The table's functionality and timeless design are all contributing factors to the value of this incredible piece. Considering the sun damage and the altered top, the previous valuation of 35,000 pounds is revised down to a more realistic range of Minimum of 10, possibly 12,000 yeah. is yeah. more realistic because yes. it's great. The guest brought in a large pilot's watch, initially valued at around 2,000 pounds based on its design and markings. It is, however, a World War I Omega model because of its clean white dial and black numbers, a style ideal for pilots who needed to read the time quickly in the cockpit. The large size, another characteristic of pilot's watches, would have made it suitable for wearing outside a thick leather or fleece flying jacket. The guest had purchased the watch for a mere 70 or 80 pounds 22 years ago at a market stall. 70 or 80 pounds, and I think I gave him about a tenner to get it fixed, which was a lot that's, of money. That's a lot of money. Yeah. However, a hidden detail inside the watch completely transformed its value. A faded inscription on the back revealed a repair bill dated 1933 from T.E. Shore, located at Clouds Hill, Clouds Hill. This was the residence of Lawrence of Arabia, a famed British military officer and archaeologist who played a pivotal role in the Arab Revolt during World War I. The inscription hinted at a fascinating possibility. The watch might have belonged to Lawrence himself. Owning a timepiece that once belonged to such a legendary figure would be highly desirable for collectors, significantly increasing its market value. In this light, the watch's value ranges from Maybe yeah. five, maybe ten. Good God, I better get it in order. Purchased by our guest at an antique shop in Winter Park, Florida, these pieces were acquired from a woman claiming Native American ancestry on both sides. Initially thought to be Cherokee or Seminole, they were recognized as Northern Plains artifacts upon closer inspection. The first item is a Sioux pipe bag from the Plains, likely from around 1880. Yeah. And this is usually more empty, but this is heavily beaded, so it's r rather unusual. It is, for and, it's, the and it's beaded on both sides. Right, and you have sort of the tin cones here with some horse hair that's dyed. The second item, from about 1880, is Southern Plains, Comanche, Kiowa. It's an all case, used for making clothing. Right. They, they'd pierce the deer skins, which would help the, with the stitching. It's very sort of delicate work, very tiny beads, probably from Venice. Yeah. And these are glass tubular beads here. Okay. The earlier ones would have probably been a uh, bird bone, leg yeah. bone or something like that. The highlight piece is a strike -alight, also Southern Plains Comanche Kiowa, dating back to around 1860. It's a fire-making tool with brass beads from France. Now the back is also quite interesting. This is commercial leather. It's oak tanned. It's probably from saddle leather, some kind. Purchased 10 years ago for $1,500, the appraised values are approximately $3,500 to $4,000 for the pipe bag, $800 to $1,000 for the all case, and six dollars to $8,000 for the strike -a light making it a valuable collection. No kidding. That's terrific. This dusty heirloom clock made its way into the antique shop, carrying more than just time. The Philadelphia marked on the dial offered a clue to its origins. Far more than a mantelpiece ornament, this clock held a lifetime within its ticking heart. E. Howard and Company, number one regulator, they murmured, the top of the line in accuracy. This is not just a clock, it's a time capsule of 1870. Back in the day, it graced the walls of important places banks, railroad stations, keeping time that mattered. In pristine condition, with its original bob and gleaming cherry case, this beauty could fetch a fortune. This would probably bring anywhere from thirteen to fifteen thousand wow, dollars. That's great. That is great. That is great. <laughs> that is great. The Scopes Monkey Trial, held in Dayton, Tennessee in 1925, gained fame for the debate between religion and science. It began as a publicity stunt after the Butler Act made it illegal to teach evolution in schools. 
John Thomas Scopes, a substitute teacher, was sponsored to challenge the act. It really escalates very quickly, and all of a sudden you've got the ACLU bringing in, on their side, the famous attorney Clarence Darrow. The trial, attracting over 2,000 people, was a national sensation. The book, at the center of the controversy, was A Civic Biology by George William Hunter. William Hunter's A Civic Biology was published in 1914. In that, there are sections that clearly discuss the topic of evolution. Textbooks, like A Civil Biology, were recycled and reused, making surviving copies valuable. An auction estimate for such a copy would be one to two hundred dollars. Charles Darwin's works, particularly The Origin of Species and Descent of Man, are highly sought after. A fine copy of Descent of Man could auction for three to four thousand dollars, while On the Origin of Species could fetch one hundred to one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Francis, it's been wonderful talking to you about all this. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here.